Christ. So, let's begin with our announcements, if, if we can, and uh, we'll be short and sweet with those. Um, Tuesday, um, oh, today, golly, 11.15, our pastor's Bible study downstairs. And we're thinking about moving to another room, so um, we'll talk about that when we get downstairs, okay, at 11.15. Um, Tuesday, Beloved Apprentice Online, for those of you that have a computer and would like to join Sue and some other ladies um, for the Beloved Apprentice Prayer and Bible Study. Um, Wednesday is our confirmation class. Um, let's see, also is our uh, Bible study on the Gospel of John at 6.30 on Wednesday evenings. And Thursday, uh, our church council will meet at 6.30, the deacons at 5.30. And let's see, what's the next slide? Is there another slide there? January's Mission of the Month. There is a sign-up sheet in the narthex to help on January 29th and February 5th. And we're also seeking sponsors for Teen Challenge dads to bring their daughters. And we're asking for some donations of $30 per ticket, uh, uh, $60 per couple um, for the Teen Challenge dads to bring their daughters to the father-daughter ball. So um, please sign up to help for January 29th. And the fifth. A uh, food share will take place on January 20th from 11.30 to 12.30. And our food share packing is January 18th at 1.30. I will be on vacation on the 18th, so I would like those that can help, please come help pack. We're not going to have that many bags. I'm just going to um, order enough food to bring us up to 60 bags because we have 28 left. So, um, we're going to have 60 bags, and we're going to pack like 37, 35, 37 um, on uh, that Tuesday, the 18th. And then the actual distribution of the food share bags is Thursday, the 20th. So please come and help at 1.30 to pack those bags. And we do need donations continually to keep the food share running, just to let you know. Um, during certain months, we don't need as much, and some months we do need more. So um, please um, help with that also. And this is over and above your um, regular offerings for Christ Lutheran Church. 
So um, pray to God for how you can help with us. Okay, and uh, at the end of service, we do have coffee and fellowship downstairs after worship. Um, we have some good treats downstairs, I'm sure. And so please come and join us with that. Okay, all right. So let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship now as we begin this morning. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, at the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River, you proclaimed him your beloved Son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Make all who are baptized in his name faithful in their calling as your children and inheritors with him of everlasting life. And we pray this through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sins, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. We confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And now, Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority. I therefore declare to you and forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we enter into worship, we will enter in by singing Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Please stand as you are able this morning. Let us worship the Lord this morning. seated. And now, the service of the Word. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. 
Our Old Testament lesson today is from Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 7. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you, I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Here ends our New Old Testament reading. Our psalm today is Psalm 29, a psalm of David. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders, Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare, and in his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Our New Testament lesson is from Romans 6, verses 1 through 11. What shall we say then? We are to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death who died he died to sin, once and for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Here ends our lesson. Amen. Please stand with me as you're able and ask God to open the eyes of our hearts to hear his gospel lesson.
Today's gospel lesson is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verses 15 through 22. As the people were in expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been, repro been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, that he locked up John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form, like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to thee, O Christ. Please be seated. So today's message is united with to Christ. United to Christ, or united with Christ. And what is especially important about our message today is in conjunction with the baptism of Jesus, is our own baptism. And so what I would like to do today is to help you understand what it means to be united with Christ or united to Christ. And our lesson is taken, or our, my message is taken from our lesson in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. So, the first thing that Paul says here in Romans is, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? In other words, should we remain in sin? Do we keep on sinning that grace abound? And what is grace? Grace means to show kindness to someone, with the implication of graciousness on the part of the one showing such kindness, right? <clears throat> so, God's grace, God's kindness, should he show that more to us when we keep on sinning? And Paul says, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Died to sin. When we hear that, do we think that, boom, we've died, period. In this instance, no. In this distance, it means the process of dying. Like to be dead as far as desiring to sin. Or to be like a corpse as far as temptation to sin or concern. Okay? So this is meaning that, that when, when we die spiritually, when, we're, when we die with Christ, and we're going to get to that here, that means the process starts. The process of dying to sin begins. And where does it begin? Paul says in verse 2, he says, by no means, how can we who have died to sin live in it? How do we die to sin? In verse 3 it says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Okay, Jesus identified with everyone when he was baptized. And the baptism was for repentance toward the forgiveness of sins. Okay, Jesus was sinless. He had not sinned. But he identified with people in order to save them. That he would take upon himself the sins of others, of the whole world, upon himself. So he was baptized to fulfill all righteousness, he says in another gospel. 
So, died means the process of dying. Died to sin indicates that believers are no longer under the power and control of sin. They must not live as though they are still under it. Okay? So we live as Christians after our baptism with the understanding that we are no longer under the power of sin. We actually have the means to choose not to sin and go contrary against the law of God or the Ten Commandments. And we should live as though we're not under its control. Because when we were under its control, we had, we had no real temptation, really no temptation, and we really um, didn't care whether we sinned or not. So in verse 3, he says, Don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? <clears throat> Baptized into union with Christ Jesus. Okay? We were baptized into union with Him. We were baptized into His death. Okay? So, as Christ died, when we, when we are brought into union with Him, we die with Him to sin. He died to sin on the cross. He was not a sinner, but sin was imputed to Him. He took upon himself all of our sins. So in him, when we're in union with him, we die with him to sin. In verse 4, it tells us, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Okay. We were buried, therefore, with him by means of baptism into death. In baptism, believers spiritually die with Christ. The believer dies to sin and is really dead to the power of sin. The purpose of dying and being buried with Christ is that in accordance with the resurrection of Christ, we are also raised with Christ to newness of life. And that's what baptism shows. It really doesn't show it in pouring, but it shows it in immersion. Okay? So we're, we die with Christ. We stand there, or in, in the lake, or in the baptistry, but we stand there. And we are, we are, we are baptized. And we die. And then we're buried. Along with Christ. And then we are raised to newness of life. However, we are baptized into union with the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So when we are raised, we are raised to newness of life. Like Christ was raised after his death to newness of life. In verse 5 it says, For we have been united with him in a death like his. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We have become united to Christ. That have, having become united to Christ is an intimate and progressive union. If it were complete union, then we wouldn't have any any uh, temptation to sin or we wouldn't sin at all you see and it says we shall also be identified with him in his resurrection so through Christ we closely we're closely associated in a similar experience as Christ so Jesus dies on the cross and we die to sin's power Jesus is resurrected from the dead, and we too are spiritually resurrected. Plus, we have a bodily resurrection to look forward to, just like Christ. Therefore, the body of sin, um, well, let's, let's, look, let's look at uh, verse 6 here. Okay, 
So we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Okay, so when you're not a believer, you're enslaved to sin. You have no control over the power of sin over you. Okay, you don't. What is our old self? So before a believer is baptized, he is figuratively another person. The old, unrenewed self. This is the Christian before his union with Christ. The body of sin that Paul is talking about represents a vital union of the body with our immaterial nature. That nature which you don't see, which is animated by our soul. And that's the principle of our individual life. So the body of sin means our body is ruled by the power of sin, in which our body parts are instruments of unrighteousness. And it says members, okay? Our members, which actually mean our body parts, okay? We sin with our body parts. It's the truth. So, when it says the term brought to nothing, it is better understood to mean to render inactive. And I was thinking about this, and what I thought of was, I don't know how many people follow football or any other kind of professional sports, but when a person is injured or sick, okay, they're put on the inactive list. They're still on the team, but they're not playing. You see? Our sinful nature has been rendered inactive. It's there. Because now a Christian is tempted. From where when in our old self, there was really no temptation. Because sin was the way our way of life. But now, that sinful nature has, our old self has been rendered inactive. It's on the inactive list. It, it list. It's still there. And it could still raise its ugly head. But we have control over that now. It doesn't have control over us anymore. So in verse 7, he continues, For one who has died has been set free from sin. So those who have been crucified with Christ in baptism have been set free from the power of sin. We are crucified with Christ. And in, verse, and in verse 8, Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will live with him. And, and Paul explains both verses 7 and 8 to us when he writes to the church in Galatia. In verse 220, he says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. We have been crucified with Christ. That's where, that's where in the mystery of the sacrament of baptism, that's what the Eastern Church calls the sacraments. He, they call them mysteries. Because of what God does in the sacrament of baptism, it's a mystery how he does it. But when, you, when you're baptized, you are crucified with Christ. And you're buried. You're, you're dead first, then you're buried. You're not buried first and then die. You, you're dead and then you're buried. And then you're raised to newness of life. So in verse 9, we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. And death no longer has dominion over him. Jesus has conquered death. So that death has no authority over him because of his resurrection. And now it doesn't have authority over us either. Even though we're afraid sometimes of death. It doesn't have authority or dominion over us anymore. Why? Because in baptism, we are spiritually resurrected to newness of life. And when this old 
mortal body dies and is no more and our soul goes to be with the Lord, there will come a day when God will raise our bodies up to meet our soul and spirit and evermore be united with Him. So that is how Jesus has conquered death. And so in verse 10, He says, For the death He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. Jesus was truly God and truly man. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He had flesh like you and I. And on the cross, he died a human death. The difference was that on the third day, he rose again and had a new body, a new spiritual body, which actually had the scars from his death on the cross to show the people who he really was. Put your finger here. Put your hand in here. Christ died for us in two senses. In regard to sin's penalty, he met its legal demands upon the sinner. In regard to sin's power, He forever broke its power over those who belong to him. If you belong to God, if you belong to Christ, he has broken the power of sin over you. His death will never need repeating. Ever, never, ever need repeating. And the point is that believers have died to sin in the same way. because of what God has done for us in baptism. We have died to sin the same way Christ died on the cross who knew no sin, who took on sin for us. St. John Chrysostom says, he was not subject even to sin. In other words, Jesus had no inclination to sin. He may have been tempted but he did not sin. But for our sin, Jesus came that he might destroy it and to cut away its strengths and all its powers. <clears throat> John Chrysostom used cut away its sinews. And that's a metaphor for strength or power. So he cut, he, Jesus cut away <clears throat> the strength and the power of sin in our lives. And therefore he died. He died for that. And Christ died once and for all. Meaning Christ's death was a single occurrence to the exclusion of any other occurrence. Christ died once and never again. Because he was raised from the dead. And he could not die after that. He could not die after that. That's one of the things, this, this point, verse 10, is one of the things that Martin Luther really, really battled with, with the Roman Catholic Church. In that they offer a repeated sacrifice every time they have the Lord's Supper, every time the Eucharist is celebrated, every time they approach Holy Communion, they re-sacrifice Christ. That's why they, they keep his the, 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 the monstrance that has the host in it all the time. Because they think that that's his body in that, in that sense that it has to die every time that they have the Eucharist. So the word of God tells us that Christ died once and for all, never to be repeated. And that says it all over the book of Hebrews as well. That his sacrifice is once and for all, never to be repeated. So in verse 11, the last verse of our lesson, it says, so you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. In some translations, it says you must reckon yourselves or to reckon or to consider means to have an absolute, 
unreserved confidence in what you know in your mind to be true. Based on what? Based upon God's Word. It's the kind of heartfelt confidence that affects your actions and your decisions. I've died with Christ. I'm dead to sin. I need to start living like it. I need to say no to those temptations. I need to think about what I'm going to say if I'm attacked. Or how am I going to react to a certain situation? Am I going to react as Christ would react? Or am I going to react as my flesh would want me to react? Oh, I throw that punch or say that nasty word or be cruel with my words. In conclusion, and here's where we tie all this in, okay? Here's why we, here's the reason why we have to understand what it means to be united with Christ, united to Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. That word baptized in 1 Corinthians is the word used for the sacrament of baptism. Okay? And it says, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. Okay? So we're united with Jesus Christ in our baptism. Because we are united with Christ, we are united together as one body. Christ's body, the church. Therefore, the unity of Christ's church is accomplished by means of baptism. God, the Holy Spirit, influences our hearts and our minds and brings us into the right relation with Jesus Christ. He adds us as members to his body and seals and confirms to us our salvation. Last week, we talked about Ephesians, about how the, the Holy Spirit is a seal, okay? The down payment for our salvation. He seals and confirms to us our salvation. So, the nationality or social status of an individual person has nothing to do with the process of what God does for us and to us in baptism. For the Holy Spirit makes no distinction between persons. We have all received the same identical spirit. We've all been clothed with the same Christ. In, in Galatians 3.27, for those who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We've been clothed. We're, it's passive. It's all in the passive tense. We've been clothed. We've been clothed with Christ. With the life of Christ. And incidentally, we were all made to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what it means. We were all made to drink of it. It says that we were all made to drink of it. It wasn't just given to us to, you know, like you get a little wine from the wine vineyard, you know. Here, here's a little bit, you know, try this and see if you like it. We were made to experience, to drink the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's not optional. We were all made to drink of it. He was and is the spiritual refreshment which our souls receive by faith. For the drinking of the Holy Spirit includes all the nourishment for our souls. And it's received for the benefit of the entire body and all of its members. That's why when you look on, continuing in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, you'll see all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Paul talks about them in Romans and talks about them in Corinthians and talks about them again in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians and in, verse, in uh, chapter 4 of Ephesians about Gifted people give it to the church. So,
So having been united with Christ means that we have been united with one another. That's the bottom line. We have. <clears throat> have you ever been somewhere, walking down the street, waiting on a bus or a train, whatever? And I know I have. But someone comes up to you, and they say hello, and you say hello. And then, all of a sudden, you're prompted to say, are you a Christian? And they smile big and they say, well, yes, I'm a Christian. Are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, praise the Lord, brother. Or praise the Lord, sister. You know. Why? How do you know that? It's because having been united with Christ, we have been united with one another. We know that. We know that in each other. We should know that in each other. God's word declares in Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, he says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. He implores us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which we have been called. We have been called, we have been elected, we've been predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. So Paul's imploring us to walk that way. And how should we walk? With all humility, all gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Do we show tolerance for one another in love? Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's a reason for walking in the manner of the calling which we have been called. In the way in which we walk with humility, gentleness, patience, being tolerant of one another, and love is the impetus behind that tolerance. That we would preserve the unity of the Holy Spirit in the bond of peace. To preserve. How is it preserved? The bond of peace preserves the unity of the Holy Spirit. Just as the Holy Spirit can be quenched in us as Christians, we too can harm the unity of the Holy Spirit within the body of Christ by not walking as Paul is imploring those to walk. And really in conclusion, Therefore, let's heed the word of the Lord from 2 Peter, where he says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God. Remember my messenger article about knowing God. And of Jesus Christ our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. So that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. That means sharers. Fellow sharers. We become partakers of that. We actualize this in our own lives. We become partakers of the divine nature. We don't become divine like God, but we become sharers in that divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust, we have escaped that. We have been redeemed from that. We have died to that. And now for this very reason also, applying all diligence, the apostles use that word a lot. Diligence. Do you know what it means to be diligent? In your faith. He says, applying all diligence in your faith. Supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, 
love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless or unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind, short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, brothers and sisters, be all the more diligent to make certain of his calling and election, of his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, he says, you will never stumble, you will never fall away. For in this, for in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Abundantly supplied to you. Your entrance into the eternal kingdom will be abundantly supplied to you. Just the thought of that, it's, it's amazing. So, beloved, let us preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace here at Christ Lutheran Church. Amen. My Jesus, I love thee. Hymn number 79. You can remain seated right now. Please stand as we confess our faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the 
Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died in his burial. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Now is the time to prepare our hearts for prayer this morning. The Church of God must pray. We must pray all the time. There's so much need for prayer. There's so much need for prayer for the people and our church, for our church, and for all the church across the world. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you have fulfilled all righteousness in the baptism of your beloved Son. As we have received this righteousness by our baptism into him, make us bold in faith and fervent in love, that we may live out our heavenly lives even in this world. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Lord God, as you open the heavens to your church through the holy, through holy baptism, Give her faithful teachers to proclaim your Son, Jesus Christ, and all that accords with godliness, that many would repent of their sins and join him in his heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Preserve the family, O oh God, especially all Christian homes. Turn husband and wife toward one another in love. Equip fathers and mothers for their holy duty as teachers of the faith. And preserve all children in the saving faith and certain promises of their baptism unto life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty Father, you break the wicked with your rod for the sake of your beloved children. Help us all at all times to serve you with fear and to seek refuge always in the kingdom of your Son. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Heavenly Father, your Son, Jesus Christ, is the true Christ, the true Messiah, the true King of this world. And grant great humility to the rulers of this world, that they would submit to the preaching of, of his holy word for the sake of their own souls and for the good of your holy people. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Lord, you sent your Son to serve your people and deliver them from sin and death. And because we long for your salvation, bring us out of our afflictions and uphold those, all those who are bruised in spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, Heavenly King and Father, you manifested yourself with the Holy Spirit in the fullness of grace at the baptism of your dear Son. With your voice, you directed us to the one who has borne our sins that we may receive grace and forgiveness, life and salvation. Keep us, we implore you, in the true faith. Since we have been baptized in accordance with your command and the example of your Son, strengthen our faith by your Holy Spirit and lead us to everlasting life and salvation through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day in our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, for our offering um, hymn today, it is Take My Life and Let It Be as we receive our morning offering. Just a word about this song that we're going to sing for the offering, Take My Life. It's a little bit new. Um, some of it you'll recognize. And so um, just... Uh, hear this song as a prayer and join in as you uh, recognize the melody and the words. 
Please stand as you're able. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them fall in ceaseless praise. Take my hand. Father, what we have is from you, and what we have from you is evermore to you. And Father, as we give these gifts to you for the ministry of the gospel and for the sake of the ministry of this church, bless them, use them according to your will and purpose, through Christ our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, that peace which passes all of your understanding. And you're going and you're coming and you're lying down and you're rising up from this day forth and forevermore. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So as we remain standing and, and our in, our our last hymn is, Lord, I Lift Your Name on High. And um, there will be a prayer for the new year afterwards. Is that right? I don't remember putting that in there. But this is our last hymn for this morning. Lord, I Lift Your Name on High.
peace and serve the Lord. Thank you for being here with us this morning. God bless you all.